uh, its joint work with Carl Helfrich, Roger Grimshaw, and uh, Dmitry Polonofsky. What is the reduced Ostrovsky equation? Well, you take the KDV equation and you put it in a weakly rotating environment. Uh, so you could think of this. Think of this as the X momentum equation. And now here we've got a Coriolis term brings in the Y velocity, the Y momentum equation, the Coriolis term brings in the X velocity. What are the parameters here? Well, nu is the nonlinearity, of course. Lambda is a non hydrostatic parameter, and gamma is our Coriolis or our rotation parameter. There are lots of familiar limits of this. If it's non-rotating, but it's hydros and it's hydrostatic, then we lose these two terms. And of course, we've just got the inviscid Berger or the Hoff equation. And you know that all localized or periodic solutions are going to break. If we knock off the rotation, we're left with the KDV. And you know that no regular initial conditions will break. So what happens if we make it hydrostatic? We knock off the third order derivative, we keep the Coriolis effect, then it's rotating, but it's hydrostatic. This we call the reduced Ostrovsky equation. It was also looked at by Hunter, so it's sometimes called the Hunter equation and the Fashenko equation. And then numerical results are that some initial conditions break and that others don't. So we can rescale this equation rescale it and we introduce the anti-differentiation operator and now we've sim this is our equation the reduced Ostrovsky equation and this is the equation we'll talk about um, it's been looked at by a lot of people before one of the earliest works was this work by Hunter the one I'll concentrate on initially is this one by Boyd and he introduced this concept that he called micro breaking and what micro breaking is, is that if you take two sets of initial conditions, we've actually got one set of initial conditions here, which is just below the breaking criterion, one that's just above it at t equals zero. By t equals nine, the one just below it is still arbitrarily smooth, but the one just above it has developed this very small step. So the step's vertical, but it's arbitrarily small height. And so that's what um, Boyd called micro breaking. The traditional way of diagnosing that is to look at the Fourier coefficients. So if we look at the Fourier coefficients of the smooth one, as you expect, they decay. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. So if you look at the Smooth one, of course, as you'd expect, the Fourier coefficients decay exponentially, and then they're at machine precision. If you look at the broken wave, then of course they just decay algebraically. You could try and quanti quantify this. You could uh, say, just take the magnitude of the highest 128 of say the 2000 coefficients. And if you look at that, you find that they all go along at machine precision, then suddenly they jump up. And of course, that's when this thing is said to have broken. Or for the smooth wave, they just continue at machine precision. But of course, you can do better than that. Uh, the reduced Ostrovsky equation, it's a first order quasi linear PDE. It's got only one characteristic. So that characteristic on the characteristic dx dt is u. Then this is its governing equation. So let's just introduce characteristic coordinates. And the characteristic coordinates, of course, are just the same as Lagrangian coordinates. They just move with the fluid. So we introduce Lagrangian coordinates. They've been used before in the context of rotating flows by uh, Zeitling, Vatham and Zeitling. So here are our, going to be our new coordinates, chi and t. t is just our ordinary t, and chi is going to be constant on uh, characteristics. And here's our equations, that xt is u, ut is our inverse operator. 
and we'll choose that the characteristic coordinate coincides with x initially. So it's the same. Well, no surprise, this is what it would look like, that here are our characteristics in the laboratory frame, in the xt frame, and of course, in the characteristic frame, the Lagrangian frame, they're straight lines. So here's our system. That's what we just had a minute ago. Now let's differentiate with respect to chi. We get x chi t is u chi. But x chi, it's the Jacobian of the transformation. So let's, we'll introduce phi for that. It's the Jacobian of the transformation. And we'll introduce w for u chi. So this equation is just phi t is w. And our other equation becomes wt is phi u. Well, what do we know about the Jacobian? The Jacobian is um, unity initially because we chose x and chi to be the same. And provided it's positive, provided it remains bounded and positive, the transformation is 1, 1. So as we'll see later, this means that the waves don't break. If phi passes through zero, then of course the, the mapping is no longer one one, the waves overturn. And this is a classic thing you see it in the Hoft equation as well, of course. And it means that in phi space or in our characteristic space, nothing unusual happens and numerics are perfectly happy. So breaking is very easy. Breaking is just find when phi passes smoothly through the origin. And here's just a typical integration. Here's the dashed line is um, a characteristic integration and it just shows it smoothly overturning. And the solid line is a shock capturing um, algorithm. Okay. So Crankle made a very interesting observation. If you take the um, reduced Ostrovsky equation, differentiate it twice and rearrange, you can write it in this form. You get Ft plus the x derivative of uf is zero. Of course, that's just a density equation. It says that F cubed, well, the, I haven't said what F is, but this is what F cubed is. F cubed, which is one minus three xx, is a conserved density. So this equation has a conserved density. And that's very nice because if we put that in characteristic coordinates, it just says that F times the Jacobian is independent of time. So it's equal to its initial value, but it's an initial value, that's F zero of chi, chi is X. So we actually know this function, it's F zero F of X, because X and chi are the same initially. So the F zero here is a known function determined by the initial conditions. Also, we know that until, if the wave doesn't break up until it breaks, then the, the Jacobian has to stay positive. So we can, we've got a solution for F in a certain sense, if we know the Jacobian, F is just this known F zero divided by the Jacobian. This is quite helpful because it means if initially we have a, a region where F zero is positive, then F zero over for those chi will remain positive for all time, just from this relation, because phi is positive. Similarly, if F zero is negative, then in that region, F0 will remain negative for all time. And if F0 is zero, then F will be zero on that characteristic for all time. So the chi domain, the characteristic domain, is divided permanently into these regions where F is positive, negative, by lines where F is zero. And that's what we had in that picture that you might have a region where F zero is positive. So F zero, F will be always positive. If it's negative, it'll always be negative. So now let's just, we can actually can eliminate one of these variables. So if we just, this was our F, if we now try and put that in terms of phi, we get that F in terms of phi is this expression but we already had that F times phi was F zero. 
So we can now eliminate either F or phi. If we eliminate F, we get this single equation for phi. If we eliminate phi, we get this single equation for F. So how about integrability? Well, it's, we know that if you've got some smooth initial conditions, then somewhere u double dash must be zero, smooth bounded initial conditions, somewhere u double dash is zero. So f zero must be one somewhere. So let's suppose it's, well, it's positive everywhere. If it's positive everywhere, then this mapping is one, one. All we've done is taken d zeta to be a positive function times d psi. And in terms of this new zeta, our equations either for f, where h is one over f, or for phi, where h is phi over f zero, just becomes this equation. And this is the well-known equation. It turns out the Tsitsika equation, and it's known to be integrable. So provided f is positive, we can transform this to an integral equation. Moreover, h is positive initially because phi and f are positive, f zero are positive. So h is positive for all time. And so phi is positive for all time. So the mapping is one, one for all time. So we have a one, one mapping to an integral equation. So our equation is integrable. I think that's what I just said there. Uh, it's still true, we assume that, there, that it was non-zero in that interval. It's still true if there were isolated values because of course that mapping remains one, one. So the only thing we've got to worry about is if there's an interval of X in which this condition is violated. So let's suppose, to make it easy, that we've got an interval of X where F zero is negative. Let's say it's negative from chi one to chi two, some interval. What can we do about that? So this is this picture again. Here we are. We've got a positive region, a negative region, and a, a positive region. Well, let's just integrate the equation. Here we are. This, we've just integrated with respect to time. We just get that I'll call this quantity beta, log phi sub x. And it's, we've just integrated the right-hand side with respect to time. But this integrand is actually positive for all phi because we're taking f to be negative. So this is a positive number for all phi. Moreover, its minimum value, which is positive, is independent of time. So we've got this quantity b, beta, which is positive over this whole interval. But that tells us that phi x is positive over the whole interval. So we get the strange result that phi does not achieve its minimum value in this interval. So in other words, if it's going to break, which is when phi, the lowest value of phi goes through zero, it can't occur in a region where F is negative. It actually is going to occur in what you might've thought of as the integrable region. So it's going to break in the integrable region. Okay. So what can we do? Here's beta. Oh, we've integrated now. What have we done now? Oh, because it's that, that bound holds, we can, we can just integrate that. And we know that this is the minimum of that integrand. So beta must be greater than that integrand times the length of the interval t. So we've got beta is greater than this number times t. And then if we integrate this with respect to x, take the exponential, we find that phi at the left-hand end is less than phi at the right-hand end times this decaying exponential, where alpha is just the integral of F zero over this interval. So it says that the left at the left-hand end, the Jacobian is decaying exponentially fast compared to the Jacobian at the right-hand end. So if this remains bounded, this becomes exponentially small over a time scale of order alpha t. And there's a plot for what this is. It's a very, very, it's a solution that only exceeds the 
breaking criterion by 10 to the minus five. So it exceeds the breaking criterion by 10 to the minus five. So it takes a long time to break. It actually doesn't break till 2081. And this is the alpha T minus alpha T graph. And it is, appears to be capturing the, uh, the decay of the Jacobian. In fact, here's um, a test where uh, we've just taken the excess over the breaking criterion to be four times 10 to the minus four, right down actually to four times 10 to the minus, four times 10 to the minus three, down to four times 10 to the minus five. So two orders of magnitude, but this alpha times the breaking time varies by about say 5%. So it does seem that alpha captures the, um, the breaking time. What's the Jacobian look like when it breaks? Well, this is our, the initial F0, that's this thin line here, and it has a very small region here where it's negative. So, and this is the Jacobian, and the Jacobian goes to zero somewhere here. If we blow that up, and how have we blown it up? We've blown it up so that the negative region stretches from xi minus one to xi plus one, and it has depth one. And here is the Jacobian coming down, and here is its first zero. And you can see the first zero is pretty well occurring where xi is minus one. And that in the neighborhood of that, it's uh, symmetric increasing. Can we derive that? Well, yes, we can. We just um, suppose that we exceed our criterion by, re but, yeah, please. It can't achieve its minimum, that's quite right. So we know that this point is not between minus one and one. As it is, it'll turn out that it's as close, it's going to be on minus one. Yeah, but you're right, it can't be between minus one and one. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah. Okay, so we're right. So we're going to assume that uh, you just slightly exceed, or this quantity, yeah, U double dash slightly exceeds a third. So we've got U double dashed is some number A minus, it's symmetric, so it's going to be b into x minus x, some chi zero, chi minus chi zero all squared. a is the, the maximum value, and b is just the next order in the expansion. And this is the minimum value, so the linear term is absent. We can then calculate f, is f zero, has this form, where we, insisted that it's parabolic and it's parabolic from here and that the xi vanishes or that it um, the zeros just like on our picture are at xi equals plus or minus one and that forces this scaling for xi if we that forces this scaling for phi and when we put that into our governing equation our equation is of this form and is parameter free, provided that we choose this as our time scale. So this is the time scale for the evolution of the Jacobian as it's approaching its final zero. And that of course is what we expected. It shows that the breaking time scales as the excess value to the five sixths. From our picture, we couldn't tell. We could just say that very, very slowly. Now we can say that it's actually to the power five sixths. We can do a little bit more. If we're at large time, then in fact, actually for any time, the um, first term in our equation is always less than an eighth 
the second term. So we can drop the first term. And this is our equation now, a governing equation. But this actually has a simple solution of the form A plus B of chi times T, just linear in T, provided B has a particular form. So here it is a solution of that equation. And because we know that F zero is positive in this region, this is positive. So it says it's monotonically increasing away from X one. This is the point X one, showing us that the zero is going to occur. The minimum value occurs right on X one and that phi should increase monotonically away from F one. And at F one, the value decreases linearly in time to vanish when T is TB. And that's about what we're seeing here. That, that it increases monotonically away from X1. And in fact, we haven't shown it here, but it decrease, decays linearly with T. And in fact, here's a plot of the minimum value of the Jacobian now not the log of the minimum, but the actual minimum value. And you could see that it's decreasing approximately linearly. And this is just to show you that it's always less than a half. Well, the term, the value of the Jacobian is less than a half the uh, value of F and therefore the cube of the Jacobian is less than an eighth. That was our justification for throwing out the, um, the first term. So that's it really. What we've shown is that um, a result, we can put it back in terms of the unscaled equation. If we introduce say an Ostrovsky number, it's three times mu, the uh, nonlinearity, kappa our curvature divided by gamma, the Coriolis parameter. If we introduce this term, then initial conditions with the Ostrovsky number bigger than one break, those with an Ostrovsky number less or equal to one don't break. If we increase the nonlinearity or the curvature, that increases the Ostrovsky number. If we increase the rotation, that decreases the Ostrovsky number. We can do the same thing with the, the modified Ostrovsky equation, which is relevant for a rotating hydrostatic two layer Boussinesque fluid where the layers have the same depths. That just converts the linear or the quadratic term into a cubic term. The same sort of thing shows that the wave breaks if the slope, the wave doesn't break if the slope is less than one everywhere in the initial conditions and the wave breaks if the initial conditions have slope greater than one. So that really completes all I wanted to say about breaking and integrability. And so now I'll uh, quickly run through um, something on stability. So let's take the two pi periodic solutions of this Ostrovsky equation. Whoops, here they are. Uh, we can rescale the equations. Well, the 2L periodic, I'm sorry, we can rescale it then to make them 2 pi periodic. So we're interested in the 2 pi periodic solutions of this equation. Gamma is related to the wave speed, of course. And we're going to, we're looking at the solutions that propagate without change of form. And then we're going to ask, are they stable? Written this way, U has zero mean. It can be taken as even in Z because we can just translate it. And in fact, you could show that U exists for every gamma bigger than one and less than pi squared on nine. And I think it's well known as gamma approaches pi squared on nine, the limiting wave becomes this piecewise parabolic one. And in terms of our previous stuff, the interesting thing about this piecewise parabolic one is that it has F identically equal to zero. It's right on the stability or it's right on the breaking boundary. If you uh, tried gamma larger, then it would break. Okay, well, how do you find, show something's um, stable? That's easy. You just find um, a Lyapunov functional and that's it. 
Okay, so let's try it. We've got a conserved momentum uh, Q, which is just the norm of U squared. We have a conserved energy of this equation. The standard thing, we can introduce a functional, which is the energy minus the speed times the momentum. And the, as it always works, then we know that the Euler-Lagrange equations for S give us the governing equation, the reduced Ostrovsky equation. And now we suppose we have perturbations to that, perturbations V to that. We compute the difference between U plus V and U to quadratic order in V, and we get this second variation. And of course, now we come unstuck because it's not sign definite. So this is not a Lyapunov functional. We can't use that. For later use, let's write it as just a linear operator, L sub gamma operating on V uh, dotted with V. And so L sub gamma is this linear self adjoint operator. Okay, well, if you don't, what did Homer Simpson, did he, he said, if you don't, if it doesn't work the first time, give up. So, <laughs> but we'll, we'll try once more. Uh, let's try once more. Uh, there, we know this is um, an integrable equation, so it's got all sorts of conserved quantities. Let's try a higher order energy. Here's a um, higher order energy. Here's our uh, F, our conserved, which is a Casimir for the problem. So we can divide, derive, sorry, we can define a, uh, another energy functional, which is just C minus gamma HU. In general, the, for general gamma, these will not have the same critical points as the first one, but we can just find the Euler-Lagrange equations and insist that they map to the reduced Ostrovsky, and then this will have the same critical points as S gamma, and it will, provided we choose gamma to be, have this form, capital gamma has to be little gamma cubed, 6i, i is just the first integral actually of the, um, the Ostrovsky equation, and it's a, just a constant. So we do the same trick. We try the, the second variation. Here's the second variation of that quantity. And unfortunately, there's a minus sign there again. So it's not sign definite. So it's not a Lyapunov functional. But again, let's write it as a um, quadratic form. So here we are. We've got this new self-adjoint linear operator, M sub gamma. So what do we do? Perhaps the obvious thing to do is we'll form a linear combination of these two, uh, these two um, variations or these two energy integrals. So here we are, we'll call it capital lambda. It'll depend on some constant we don't know at the moment, C, which is just some real number that we're going to find. And of course it always depends on gamma. And it's just S minus S of gamma for our U minus C times R capital gamma of U. And of course, we know immediately by construction, we've constructed it so that it's um, critical points are uh, those give us the, the um, reduced Ostrovsky equation because both of the critical points of these coincide and both of those give us the Ostrovsky equation. So what, all we need to do now is to characterize the spectrum of the corresponding linear operator. Remember the operator corresponding to S was L, the operator corresponding to R was M. So we want to characterize the linear, the spectrum of this linear operator. And in particular, if we could of course show that the eigenvalues of this are positive, then we're finished. Because then this is, for a particular values of C, then this would then form a Lyapunov functional. But again, whoops, by construction, this is self adjoint. It's got two pi periodic coefficients because we, that's what we're working on, our underlying U. So we've got blocks theorem, and that tells us that we can, it's sufficient to look at eigenfunctions of the form a plane wave 
times some function, which is 2n pi periodic. And the wave number for the plane wave, we only have to look between minus a half and a half. So we just, we just um, put, look for waves like that, but we just put that into this operator. So in fact, by fiddling around with the IKZ, that says we're interest, interested in the eigenvalues of this operator. They correspond exactly to these. And of course, the eigenfunctions are the W. So we're interested in proving that this operator here is positive. We can write it as just these. These are in fact the operators we just had, those uh, L and K, but they've been pushed by an amount I kappa because um, we multiply pre and post multiplied by I kappa, but they're just the previous operators. If you have a look, DZ has gone to DZ plus I kappa, et cetera. And now we just revert sadly to numeric, to numerics, whoops. And we can discretize those in Fourier space, evaluate all the products that appear uh, pseudospectrally. These are the uh, Fourier matrices. And then we look for eigenvalues just using MATLAB. First of all, we've got to get the, um, the base solutions. So here are the periodic solutions, the reduced Ostrovsky for various values of A. A is the first cosine coefficient. So it starts off at minus 0.3, minus 0.5, and the highest one we've got here is minus 0.65, minus 0.2 thirds, minus two thirds, of course, is the, the paraboloid. And these are the coefficients, the coefficients for the smooth ones, the numerically computed ones uh, here, and they go down to machine precision. For 0.65, you need 300 terms to get machine precision. Um, and here, of course, is the, uh, the paraboloid or the parabola. These were just obtained by uh, a Newton Kantorovich iteration. So, so that's our, we found our base solutions. Now let's look at the eigenvalues of that operator. So what, we can see them here, the red dashed lines that you can see are the eigenvalues for the solution u identically zero. So that's an easy one to find. You can find that analytically. So that's u identically zero. Then we, or which corresponds to a identically zero, which corresponds to a equals zero. And then we just increase it slightly. This is by the way is for a value when c I should say is a half. So C, we've chosen C to be a half. This is what these graphs, these eigenvalues look like. These are the lowest eigenvalues of P. Here's the eigenvalue up here. And here's kappa running from minus a half to a half. Now we've increased it to minus 0.1. And that's given us these blue diamonds. And as you can see, they're just a very small perturbation from A equals zero. We'll have a look at what's going on here more carefully in a minute. And then we increase it to A equals 0.2. It actually, what's, of course, what's going on here is it split them. Now it's split them even further. And again, it splits any time there's a repeated eigenvalue of the A equals zero problem, it's split when A is non-zero. So if you notice all the eigenvalues here are non-negative. Okay. So therefore we know that this lambda that we've got, lambda C gamma that we've constructed, if we take C equal to a half, then it will be a Lyapunov functional because we've proved this is a positive operator when C equals a half and A equals minus 0.1 or minus 0.2. So we've proved if you like stability when A is minus numerically, for A equals minus 0.1 and minus 0.2. So let's try and push this a bit further. This is the diagram we just had in, uh, before, but blown up near the origin. So it's just between minus 0.1 and 0.1 for kappa. 
here's the, the ground state and the excited state, both for n equals zero for the lowest mode. But when we take A to be non-zero, then that mode splits and we get an excited state and we get the ground state. The dashed lines are an asymptotic theory for small a and small kappa. So in the neighborhood of the origin for small a, we get this prediction, and then these are the numerics. So the asymptotics actually are extremely good for the small a, small kappa asymptotics are extremely good. What happens now if we move, make, try and make C a bit larger? We're at half. Let's make it 0.7. Well, this is what happens to the ground state in the neighborhood of the origin. Here's zero. The ground state has gone negative. So we've gained negative eigenvalues. And you can see that the numerics follows the, the asymptotics. And there it is. The numerics gives us some negative eigenvalues. So what that says is that for a equals minus 0.1, that's what this graph's for, then this capital lambda does not provide a Lyapunov functional if we choose c equals 0.7. So it provides one at c equals 0.5. It doesn't provide one at c equals 0.7. The excited band, well, not really much really happens in the excited band. It was non-zero. It stays non-zero. So that is a positive eigenvalue, it stays a positive eigenvalue. So our worry is what happens to the ground state. The ground state can switch from positive eigenvalues to negative eigenvalues. The generic behavior is that it switches as we increase C. So the ground state's concave upwards and it switches to concave downwards as we increase mod C. So go, we make C get more positive or more negative. So at fixed A, this is just saying that again, the, the, eigen, the graph of the eigenvalue is concave upwards at kappa equals zero if we're in some interval and it's concave downwards outside that interval. So can we find that interval? Uh, that's just repeating what we just said. So what is it? Well, it's the, the interval is determined. The, in, the interval is determined by the first occurrence of a negative eigenvalue of this operator. So the boundaries are determined by changes in sign, as we've just said, of the second derivative of this eigenvalue at the origin. But the first derivative, it's symmetric. So the first derivative of the origin vanishes. So the sign of this is actually the sign of the eigenvalue that you determine at a very small value of kappa, well, at a very small value of kappa, just off the origin, because we want this to be positive, then we want this to be positive, negative, one or the other. Uh, uh, so we know that the C plus and minus are determined by the values of C for which this has exactly a zero eigenvalue at some point just off the origin. So in other words, the determinant of this vanishes because I've got a zero eigenvalue. So that means if we did define it as the difference between these two linear operators. So we want the determinant of this quantity to vanish, but of course that's just a generalized eigenvalue problem. So in fact, we just need to look at the eigenvalues of this generalized eigenvalue problem for small delta. So you just do, it's just a generalized eigenvalue problem. You know these matrices, just look at their eigenvalues for small values of delta, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four. Actually, they all look the same. And this is the region that you get. Here we are, this is mod A running up here. And remember, A equals two thirds is the um, piecewise parabolic profile. And this is C. We were looking carefully around C equals a half for small A. As we run up, 
In fact, the region gets larger and larger, and then it, of course, converges to nothing at two thirds because that's where we get the, um, the peaked wave at F is zero. So, and the dashed lines here are an asymptotic theory for um, small a and small kappa. This is for the Ostrovsky, uh, the reduced Ostrovsky equation. This is for the modified reduced Ostrovsky equation. So let's just summarize what we've got. We've shown that the Ostrovsky equation breaks if this quote, uh, if this oh, triple X, double X that should be, it should breaks if um, the curvature is too large, if the curvature uh, is a small excess over one, then the, time, the breaking time varies by this quantity. And we've shown that the periodic solutions of the reduced Ostrovsky equation and the modified reduced Ostrovsky equation are orbitally stable. Okay. Are there questions? The, the underlying base solution? Yeah. Yes, you, I mean, you can, there are, whoops, there are analytical solutions, but it's much easier because you want the Fourier series eventually for the operator. So it's much easier just to do it uh, numerically. Yeah, no, that's right. There's a transformation that you can transform it into exactly, um, but the transformation is not one, one, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so looking yeah. on this last part when you talk about this uh, periodic solution, so basically you showed almost no difference. So it means that we can use whatever in applications, reduced equation or modified reduced equation, whatever for our convenience. Is that I understand your message correctly? Haven't quite caught that, Pavel. You say. Yeah, I said. Okay, maybe let me speak louder. Uh, so that uh, on second part you showed that compare with periodic solution and stability for reduced Ostrovsky and modified reduced Ostrovsky and get nearly identical results. Yes. Yeah, Does well, it mean for general solution of Cauchy problem, we basically can use any of them will get similar results or it's not that simple? If you just use some general initial condition uh, and uh, solve Cauchy problem, will it be so similar between reduced Ostrovsky and modified reduced Ostrovsky? No, very, no different. Um, the, uh, the, I mean, and the stability criteria are different too. Remember, we, we commented on that, that the stability criteria for Ostrovsky, reduced Ostrovsky, is a, one on the um, curvature. But the stability criterion for the modified reduced Ostrovsky is one on the slope. Ah, okay. So I misunderstood. Okay. Is very mm -hmm. different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there is difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. More questions? All right, let's thank uh, Ted again. And we'll resume at 2.30.